But then in addition to that, we're looking to expand on that, right? So if there's an opportunity to give out loans, if there's an opportunity to um, become the bank, right? So if we want to refinance some properties, I don't have to call Wells Fargo. I don't want to talk about Wells Fargo. I think we all saw what happened, right? <laughs> in terms of their comments. Yeah, or their history, yeah. actually, right? <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Black Student Success Podcast, where we bring you insight and guidance from successful Black professionals. It's brought to you here by Inquire Hire. My name is Selvin Inquire, and as always, we appreciate the support for you listening. So today's guest is not only or has touched on the area of sports management, but entrepreneurship as well. What we're going to do is, you know, talk to him and actually see what types of, you know, ventures that he's gone through, what types of mindset that he's had when it comes to, you know, exploring these different ventures outside of the traditional, you know, work environment. So I feel like you can never talk to too many entrepreneurs just because there's no one straight way towards success. And then everybody has their different definition of success. So uh, we're going to touch on his, you know, career within sports management, but also kind of go into the influences of, you know, getting into entrepreneurship, what types of ventures that he's gone through, as well as, you know, anything that he can, you know, drop in terms of gems within his journey. So let's welcome Trey Jenkins to the show. What's going on, man? How's it going, everybody? Great to meet you. Thanks for having me on the show. Looking forward to connecting with, uh, you know, learning more about you today. I'm excited, man. Absolutely. No, and I appreciate your time as well. So we're going to start the show as we always start the show. We're going to start off by asking, who is Trey Jenkins? Absolutely. So uh, I'd consider myself uh, more than anything a critical thinker. Um, I always like to understand beyond just what's being told to me, what's under this, you know, what's the underlining value here? How do the dots connect? Um, hard question, man. A critical thinker, entrepreneur, um, I'm an investor, both uh, through stocks and real estate, I'm really passionate about those areas. And then last, I'd say, uh, more importantly, what I'm most excited about is just giving back to the community. So uh, I work as a youth mentor uh, through my fraternity, Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, um, and primarily I'm focusing on getting our young men um, prepared for college. So uh, anything from weekly check-ins, um, before COVID, we uh, met with them at least once a month. Everybody's in uh, suit and tie on Saturdays, both mentors and kids. Um, we do weekly check-ins on Thursdays. And then um, I think ultimately just doing everything that we can do to ensure that these young Black men and Latinos are um, successful in, in every endeavor in life. So uh, yeah, that's me. Absolutely. Yeah. And I appreciate the, the work that you're doing now with the kids that you're working with. Um, you know, now that COVID's kind of the thing right now, have you guys adjusted to still try to meet with them and keep them motivated and, and you know, keep on their toes with that? Absolutely. Um, everything, you know, I think the world is on Zoom now, right? So yep. <laughs> um, I think a big thing now, you know, we, we call these kids every Thursday um, and not being in person, not being able to do that and now saying, hey, you know, sometimes getting in suit and tie on Saturdays, um, it was definitely an adjustment. Um, not being able to see them, not being able to have that in, uh, human interaction. But um, yeah, just shifting more to a digital standpoint. Um, you know, one big event that we have every year is our college signing day. So the same way athletes are able to, you know, sign and pick their schools, you know, for ESPN, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to do the same thing for kids where they have their hats of which schools they're going to. So um, that's one thing that we're trying to figure out now, just trying to figure out, you know, how to navigate that. So, you know, the kids still feel that they are um, important and, you know, valued and that type of thing. So different challenges, but, you know, we're all trying to figure it out. Absolutely. And I, and I feel like that type of thing, I think that's a really creative idea to really, you know, get them excited. And now that we're kind of all, you know, within this digital world, you know, we have the opportunity to record these things, they can relive those, those different aspects, um, especially that really important time where they're, you know, picking the school that they want to go to and really starting that next chapter. So that's, that's really dope work that you're doing. Um, now let's start with you. Let's start with, you know, kind of where it all began with you, you know, um, especially since we're on the, on the page of college, you know, you started within, within sports management. So what, you know, inspired you to kind of declare that as a major and really get to learn more about that business side behind sports? Right. So for me, um, I was an athlete in high school and college, right? So I played football, um, but realized, you know, uh, 
with everyone kind of getting concussions. I had a few concussions. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there was a teammate that I had at my high school that died. He had an aneurysm, right, oh, wow. mm-hmm. on the way to the hospital. So um, with the concussions that I had after that, putting everything together and talking to my dad, basically, he was like, you're not playing football anymore, yeah. right? So uh, focus primarily on track and uh, track and cross, cross country. Um, that's what paid for school for me. So that element of sports, I was always interested in it as an athlete. But um, I think you kind of quickly understand, like, hey, if I can make this a profession or not, like, and I wasn't that guy. I was a cool athlete, but not, you know, on that level of being able to become a professional. So um, definitely wanted to stay within the sports space, but uh, on the business side. So um, that was the connection. And, um, you know, I, I chose to be uh, in sport management and legal studies. I was a dual uh, double major. Oh, nice, nice. And then with you now going, you know, going to school for track and putting that together with that major, you know, how how was that to kind of be in that sports world in two different areas, you know, within college? What was that like for you? Uh, It was interesting because you really had to um, understand the value of your time. And you quickly realize, though we're going to school as student athletes, it's a business, man. Like, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, you know, even consider that that student as athlete really a thing. It's really you're um, an athlete who goes to school. You know, you're, you, that's really what it is, even when it comes down. And a lot of people may not realize this, but even your schedule, um, it's based around your practice schedule. Right. So early on, you know, it's like, hey, you know, go to the school, get a great education. But you're really an employee there. Right. And you're literally basing your education around. Hey, well, if I have practice two a days, three a days, sometimes don't schedule it during those practices because that's when I have to work, you know. Yeah. So um, it was it was uh, definitely a challenge, but it learned you, you know, you learn how to manage your time. You learn how to, um, you know, just get things done efficiently. And, uh, you know, I think that those those that, that uh, critical element of time management was one of the biggest pieces I took away from that experience. Yeah. And, and, and it's I think it's good to kind of get thrown into that where you have to now manage your time because taking that out and you just have school. I'm like high school, you have those gaps or you don't have those courses, you know, back to back in some cases. So you have a lot of free time and giving that to somebody who's 18 that (laughs) that could, you know, lead them to to just, you know, maybe not utilizing time the way they should. So I think that's good that you did get that structure and learn that Mm -hmm. early on because that I'm sure progressed beyond college, you know, you know, with everything else that you're doing. So, Mm -hmm. um, now, once you actually got into the the industry and kind of working for for different franchises, mm-hmm. what was the what was the competition level like when it came to getting these positions? You know, was it really was it really intense? Um, I've heard that the you know as many sports franchises are out there, even on the professional side, especially among the black professionals, is still still really you know close knit and and relatively small. So, but what was that you know, like when you're actually trying to get into the workforce? It was crazy, man. Uh, so I went to school in St. Louis, Missouri, right? And one of the biggest things for me, especially within sports, entertainment in general, right? Um, you're you're humbled very quickly. Mm. So the experience for me, I did three or four unpaid internships while I was in school, right? So for me, I was working for a minor league hockey team that isn't even in business anymore, mm. right? <laughs> So, um, you know, I I wanted to work in sports, but it's like, you know, before you get there, you have to get some type of experience. So just putting feelers out there like, hey, you know, I don't watch hockey, being very, very honest with you. Uh Um, I don't know any of those players, not a lot of people that look like me. But I think more than anything, I knew that I had to get some type of experience. So, you know, humbling yourself, checking your ego, being like, hey, you know, I might want to work for the NFL, but I'm not at that point yet, you know, and I don't have that call that I can make to some CEO to, to get me in there. Both of my parents are teachers, right? So um, just just grinding, man. So I uh, started out with that uh, that hockey team, that semi-pro um, hockey team. And then what, one thing that really worked out in my favor was the NFL lockout. Hmm. So um, I think it was maybe 2010, sometime between 2010 and 2012, um, there was a lockout in the NFL and, um, you know, for any lockout, you don't see any pictures on like the league's website, right? Like they have like a whole bunch of old stuff, a whole bunch of old clips is really weird. So what I did was I sent an email to literally as many people as possible in departments like, hey, 
I know you guys are locked out right now, but if you need me to come lift some boxes, if you need me to come, you know, be do some grunt work, like let's do it. Like let's yeah, get it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so lo and behold, uh, somebody actually responded back to me. And you know, as they started ramping back up, um, they needed help with grunt work, like going out to the to to um, you know, pick things up or you know, we need to do this. You know, I had an opportunity to work on game day too, but that was kind of my end, man. Just checking my ego, getting, you know, some uh, my feet wet, you know, just getting uh with the semi pro hockey team. And then sending those letters out to the NFL, uh, to the St. Louis Rams at that time, and uh, getting that opportunity. So that was kind of my way in. Nice, and and I like I like the fact that you were bold enough to you know send out all those emails, and then just even creatively think that okay, during this time they might somebody might need some extra help, you know, with everything going on to kind of you know take their you know take their mind off of you know all the other bigger things or whatever the case is mm-hmm. so you know bold very creative in terms of getting that in so um you know it, it, it's it's good to kind of point that out that it, it it might be like you said that ego check that you need to do and before you can really start to actually climb within that within that industry so appreciate you breaking that down now um now what can somebody do to to prepare to get in this you know, sorry, in this type of workforce? Um, is it, you know, kind of doing like the internships that you did while you're in school? Yeah. Is it, um, you know, is it finding that, you know, that little small work? Is it the networking? What, what were the kinds of things that you would say would be beneficial if somebody's trying to get in? I think for young people now, um, understand what your competitive advantage is, right? Um, and I think for a lot of young people, when it comes to this social media stuff, like, I guess uh, I'm only 28 now, but um, for anyone that's younger than me, I guess they're younger. It's weird now, you know, but (laughs) um, I don't understand some of these social media platforms, right? Like TikTok, Snapchat, I've never had them, right? Yeah, beyond me. (laughs) Right? Beyond me, right? But Gen Z, they get that stuff, right? Like they get the dances, they get all of that. They get how to um, be influencers. Like you got, you guys got, um, you know, Gen Z kids that are, have millions of followers and they're just talking about video games. Right. So what I would say is understanding what your competitive advantage is, because at a lot of these companies, though I'm 28, there's a lot of heads of marketing that are 40 years old, 50 years old, and they definitely don't understand this stuff. Mm -hmm. They don't understand TikTok. So, um, if you have that ability to learn stuff quickly, promote that, right? Promote your brand. Hey, I get that. I get this. I can show you how to do that. Um, If you want to take that same route and email some companies for internships being like, hey, like I understand this stuff. If you guys need any help, any insight, you'd actually be surprised. You know, there's different websites and different platforms that are popping up every day. So from a digital standpoint, I definitely say understand that stuff and put yourself out there. Um, I'd say that's definitely number one, learning what your competitive advantage is for sure. I have a quick story, too, if I can go into it. Yeah, please do. So um, I won't say the specific team name, but when I left St. Louis, um, I went back home up to New Jersey and um, still, you know, was trying to find my way into sports beyond the internships. Um, And one thing that I did notice is that with a lot of these teams, um, a lot of their clients who tend to be season ticket holders or, you know, they're doing big money with corporate partnerships, their kids tend to be the interns. Hmm. So let me just, let me just go into details. So I called, you know, I had applied to one of the professional sports teams in New York, called in, had applied, called in to check on the status of my education. And the lady was very honest with me and it, you know, it broke my heart at the time, but she said, you know, typically our internships go to our client's children. And it took me back. Right. Because this woman works in HR and she told me this. But the thing about it, you think of who is the audience at these games. They don't look like you and me. Mm -hmm. Right. They're not the ones that can afford these season tickets. And then once I started working for these pro teams and actually seeing, hey, all right, this this intern here, you know, her dad is one of the corporate partners here at this winery that we have that we have this deal with. Or seeing, you know, this other kid, you know, his dad is connected to the CEO of whatever bank. Those are the guys that are getting these opportunities, whether they want to be there or not. So Mm. as a person of color, um, your road is going to be a lot tougher. So you you have to be, you know, that saying that we kind of always heard is while we're young, like you got to be twice as good. You got to be more than twice as good. Mm. (laughs) You know what I mean? Because there's certain factors like I'm talking about now that 
you can't control. So if there's anything like that social media competitive advantage or anything that you can do, you have to be hungry. You have to put yourself out there and you have to really, you know, let people know like, hey, I want to work and this is why I'm here. Like you got to fight like every day is a fight. So I um, just felt that was really important for people to know, because um, beyond just applying for jobs, there's a lot of politics that goes into it. And um, I didn't have anybody telling me this while I was uh, either in college or, you know, trying to get into that professional workspace. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's it's funny that that whole legacy thing, you know, kind of bleeds yep. past the, the college, you know, the college aspect, because we can see that where, you know, those opportunities are going to the alumni or somebody who works for school, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. And, you know, thank, thank God that that, you know, HR person told you straight up that, hey, this generally goes to the, the kids of, you know, so and so who works there. Um, to now while it did take you aback that still put that into perspective okay now this is how much harder that i need to work or this is the route that i need to take to kind of get in because it's not going to be as easy if i take that traditional route so um so that's uh you know super interesting that you that you mentioned that and i totally agree when it comes to gen z that you know things like tiktok and like social media they're born into that, you know, as opposed to like our generation where we kind of had to learn it. And we, you know, we definitely have taken advantage of it. You know, we're probably like MySpace era or whatever the case is, but, um, you know, we, uh, you know, we're, we don't have that, um, that, uh, I guess you can say not, not entitlement, but the like, okay, you know, Twitter is here. This is like normal stuff. You know, Twitter was kind of introduced to us and then we kind of built up on that. So, um, so I appreciate you mentioning that and kind of going into that, you know, competitive edge and, and really having that realization of how much you got to grind for that type of stuff. So, uh, that's, that's totally dope. Now, when it comes to the transition that you made, you know, uh, you know, kind of going out of sports, but you know, you realizing that there are other opportunities, there's, you know, a, a, a bigger, there's a bigger world out there and there's other opportunities that you can, you know, venture into, you know, when it comes to that entrepreneurship, what where did that all begin for you? And and what does it mean to be an entrepreneur to you? Yeah, so I think the transition really started, um, you know, I was doing these unpaid internships and uh, through those unpaid internships going into seasonal jobs, um, you know, with different sports teams. I'd ended up with um, the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Um, I did a short stint with uh, Madison Square Garden with the WNBA there. Um, and then ended up with the Golden State Warriors uh, out in California. So I think with one of your former um, uh, people that have been on the show with Anthony, that was uh, mm-hmm. my colleague, right? Perfect. Yeah. So, uh, yep. So I think the biggest thing was there was something that was really contagious about being in the Bay Area, man. It was just this understanding of time, right? Understanding in your value, understanding in equity. And it was something that I kind of always heard of, but being around that type of energy, you know, even now, like we think of any app that might be in your phone, it's, it's based off of a company that's in San Francisco or Silicon Valley, right? Like Mm -hmm. Twitter, Facebook, Google, like all those guys. And I think that mindset of saying like, Hey, I'm out here. Um, can I start my own company or, you know, just overhearing, you know, different races being completely honest with you. Um, working some jobs because they wanted to get there for the IPO. So once that company, they can get in, get that equity, then it's like, hey, I'm 20 something years old. My company just IPO'd. I'm going to take that money that I just got from the IPO and roll that into real estate. Right. And these were conversations that I wasn't having in different parts of the country. Mm. So when I got out there and understanding, you know, how they value their time, how they valued equity, it opened my mind up. So I um, kind of wanted to, you know, keep that same energy, right? And Mm -hmm. and kind of being like, hey, you know, if I'm working in entertainment, I'm working all these hours, it's cool, but the pay isn't really good. What can I do to really value my time more? And I think that's when I started thinking differently. Mm -hmm. Where where you're thinking about that whole value aspect. Um, Yeah, because I mean, I feel like even in some industries where you can work uh, maybe a certain high position, and it's salaried. So, you know, no matter what, you know, especially being at like a director level or some of the cases, you're probably putting in more than 40 hours a week Definitely. and you are still getting paid that same, you know, you yep. know, good thing that is consistent, but it's still that same amount. And, you know, I, I totally feel you when it comes to wanting to, 
I guess maybe be paid what your worth is or, or knowing your value. And it sounds like you, you, you found that while being on the West coast. Absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. It was, uh, definitely. Sorry. Sorry to cut you off. Absolutely. No, you're good. You know, you're good. You're good. Um, no, I mean, and, and, and we took, we had some time on the West coast as well. We were in LA for two years. And I mean, I can tell you when you're surrounded by those different companies, you're really, you know, relatively close to Silicon Valley. You, you see the, the building for uh, EA Sports, you know, on our drive to work, you know, those types of things. And while, you know, we're in the Midwest and while people are more like kind of like go, go, go when it comes to the, the, the Midwest, people seem like they were more lax, but at the same time, they're surrounded by all of these different companies. So maybe they're lax, you know, they're using that time to kind of be an influencer or, or things like that. They're really surrounded by, you know, the, the people who are, are, are moving and shaking and everything. So, um, so it's, it's nice that you wanted to take that and then kind of keep that no matter where you were at. I definitely agree, man. I think um, I kind of equate, especially being at Madison Square Garden, um, you know, I work there seasonally. I equate being in that New York market to the Wolf on Wall Street. Like, if you've seen that movie where it's just like that scene with Leonardo DiCaprio and it's like, ah, like that's literally like being in New York. And it's that mindset where it's just like, you know, you might have that typical nine to five schedule, but if you leave at five o'clock, it's kind of like, ooh, did you really leave at five o'clock? You really didn't stay here until seven or eight o'clock. And I think being in that New York market, that mindset of like grind hustle is kind of like that unspoken expectation, right? So when I got to the Bay Area, especially with the Warriors, and it's like, oh, well, it's five o'clock. Well, it's 505. Like, what are you still doing here? It was kind of like, whoa, you know? Mm. And I think that that mentality breeds more of a sense where it's just like, hey, I understand my value even outside of, you know, maybe investing in other things. A big part of my value is my time, right? So if I'm leaving work on time, I have more time to be with my family, my loved ones, balancing out my life. And uh, it was a huge difference going from New York to the Bay Area, night and day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So now once you got into the space, you know, you are trying to seek these different ventures, you know, what was that like, you know, kind of making that transition from your traditional nine to five, or, you know, not only just the job, but the mindset as well, to now, you know, really getting on the grind, thinking creatively, trying to network, you know, to get to where you want to get, what was that like? So I was thrust fully into it, man. You know, there's a lot of people, especially 2020. It's, it's been a wacky year, I think, to mm. say the least. Right? <laughs> right? Wack is an understatement. <laughs> to, say, to say the least. Yeah. And I think a lot of us have been affected in different ways. And for me, you know, being very transparent, um, I had bought a, a property, uh, investment property in January. We closed on January 8th. So I was still working at that time. Um, then came the end of February. Um, and I was laid off. Mm. Right. So not only was I laid off, it's like, hey, I just bought this property um, and it needs work. How am I going to get this done? Yeah. Right? yeah. So it's like you got to think. Right. So what we ended what I ended up doing was like, hey, in terms of things, um, being at this Corona situation happened. Um, you know, we had we had contractors at that investment property and property and they ended actually ended up catching the virus. Oh, wow. So we had already, you know, had an agreement with these guys, paid them some money. But in terms of the guys that actually caught the virus, they were all, also our structural engineers. So it wasn't just like, hey, I can call anybody like you really have to vet a structural engineer. They really have to know what they're doing. And especially if you've kind of already paid them to some extent, you're kind of. I think you could get the word. that. Yeah, I, that yeah. I say, right? <laughs> uh-huh. So um, I said it to say, you know, I really had to get creative. So it's like, hey, you know, I have this property. What do I do? So what I ended up doing, I called some friends um, and I was like, hey, um, because I will have some expenses in terms of. Um, having this property, I still have to pay the bills on it. I still have to pay these contractors and I just left, lost my job. So what I did is I ended up giving some of the equity in my company um, away to other people so that I could raise money. Mm. Right. So in terms of getting a little bit of float time so that I could manage, um, you know, with this coronavirus in March, like no one kind of knew what this was. No one knew like when it would end. 
you remember like the panic in the grocery stores you couldn't find anything yeah. literally right <laughs> and buying this house you know literally right before that it was like literally the worst time to, to buy something yeah right? i totally Lost get that yeah job, all that stuff so um reached out to the people and that was really the start of like my company and just thinking about as an entrepreneur like the biggest thing as an entrepreneur is you're finding solutions of how to get things done. You won't have it always figured out, but you have to have that mindset where it's just like, hey, um, this problem happened. I can't really get emotional about this. I have to keep my calm. I have to think logically. I have to be creative and I have to figure out a way to find solutions to these problems. So um, long story short, um, it ended up being a great uh, opportunity uh, we raised the value. We were able to get tenants in there and having that extra cash by giving up the equity. Uh, that was really the start to the company. So everything is done now. You know, it's cash flowing really well. Um, we're working on different properties now. And, um, you know, that was really the start to that the, uh, the business. It's called Beckham Capital. Perfect. Yeah, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm glad you transitioned into that. And one of the things that you pointed out is um, it's okay not knowing everything, especially mm -hmm. within this world um, or actually within anything. You know, if you try to kind of map out and then know exactly how everything is going to go, especially if you are trying to factor in curveballs and everything that can kind of get you stuck and keep you from moving if you don't have all those pieces in order. But it sounds like, especially with your situation, you knew of what to kind of do. You didn't know maybe what the actual end result was. You knew where you wanted to get to, but you at least had some of those pieces together to actually start moving. And um, it, and it sounds like you have a very adaptive mind when it comes to that um, because things are going to be thrown your way, you know, that you're not going to expect, but you have to kind of really act on those. And it sounds like you did that and then fortunately turned up on top when it came to that. So uh, that's really cool to hear. So let's, let's actually get into back with the capital, what that is, uh, to, you know, tell the people, you know, you know, what inspired creating that, um, you know, what you mainly focus on and then what those goals are that you have with the company. Definitely. So um, I would describe Equity Capital. Uh, it's an investment company. Um, so it's an LC, a, a multi-member LC. And we essentially created it to promote wealth and financial literacy within communities of color. Right. So we're focused primarily on um, right now of buying holds. Um, we'll do a mixture of fix and flips. Um, but then in addition to that, we're looking to expand on that, right? So if there's an opportunity to give out loans, if there's an opportunity to um, become the bank, right? So if we want to refinance some properties, I don't have to call Wells Fargo. I don't want to talk about Wells Fargo. I think we all saw what happened right? in terms of their comments. Yeah, well, the history, yeah. actually, right? But I think there are a lot of opportunities to really be creative in this space so that we don't have to go to those traditional means when they're already talking about how they feel about us. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, that's that's where the mindset is going. So right now it's an LC. Um, we're working with a lawyer right now to convert it into an actual fund. Um, so that's all I can talk about right now, because uh, we're just still in the, in, the, in the process of turning it into a fund. But that's the vision. Uh, we're doing those fix and flips now. We're doing buy and holds, but um, the, the eventual plan is to, to turn it into an entire solution for um, the Black community. I'm just saying it. Yeah. Pull out, right? So that was the, the concept behind the name. Black, B, B equity capital. So B for Black, E for equity, understanding that. So um, in our community, can we go to some kids and be like, hey, beyond just knowing um, I want to be a football player or I want to be a rapper, now I can actually see some people and be like, hey, they're doing their thing within their own community. I can get into finance or uh, finance is actually cool. Um, I'm from Patterson, Patterson, New Jersey. And as uh, a kid, a lot of my role models were those guys, right? Like the athletes, uh, Tim Thomas at the time, Victor Cruz, the Fetty Wops. And for a lot of these guys, that's the measure of success that a lot of kids see in, in their communities. And there's nothing wrong with that, to be clear. But I think for, for people that come out of cities like this, I wanted to be a role model in addition to those guys, knowing, mm -hmm. letting you know, like beyond just being a rapper, beyond being a football player, those are great things, but there's other uh, opportunities and other ways to get it. So uh, that's why we started the company. And um, yeah, really, really excited about it. 
Yeah, no, that does really sound exciting, especially, you know, you ran into those issues when it came to, to, to legacy. You know, I think that's something our, our community would like to have as, um, you know, something to stand behind, you know, uh, where, you know, we're able to give those opportunities to, you know, the ones younger uh, than us and, and really continue to build on them. It sounds like that's what you're doing. I love that you mentioned generational wealth because that is, you know, in some cases, you know, if you don't have the knowledge behind that, it just seems unattainable. It just seems like this this unicorn that you hear about that only certain people can obtain. And um, I love that you are, you know, taking that full force and then really trying to to be able to achieve that and not only do that, but also teach those on how to, to get that. So um, I'm a big financial literacy buff. So um, nice. anytime I hear anybody who's really trying to get into that area and then teach, you know, things that we may not have learned growing up, um, you know, it's really dope to hear. So um, can I just speak a little bit more on that as well? Yeah, please. Um, it's a critical thing right now, man. I think even, um, you know, not to talk too much about the current president or get into policy, po- uh, politics, but understanding the magnitude of what they're doing, right? Like their business practices. So um, even with Donald Trump and, and seeing him pass um, this component of opportunity zones and understanding what that means, a lot of people who look like me when it first passed, I was asking, you know, some of my friends, I was like, yo, what do you think about these opportunity zones? They didn't know what the hell I was talking about. Yeah. Right. But if I talked to, you know, some people that probably didn't look like me, they, they for sure knew what these opportunity zones were and they were jumping on it. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, just to go into it, uh, he basically passed um, this idea or this legislation where there's more investments in low income neighborhoods. And basically you can offset your capital gains by investing into um, these areas. Mm -hmm. So for people that look like you and me, you know, we always have this concept of gentrification and and what's going on. And literally like you literally have, you know, um, things that are going on right now to speed this up. So if we're not talking about finance, there's an entire world, there's entire opportunities that are passing us by. So um, that went into it. Um, I think there's a a few other things kind of just going back into sports as well, just really seeing how these guys are moving. Right. And it's Mm -hmm. not just Donald Trump. Um, I think when you talk, talk about sports as well, there's also an element of that same type of mentality that you see as well. So I think, you know, when we talk about sports is usually like really fun, you know, like LeBron James had this many points, but there's also a business element and a political element that that's really not, not nice, you know? So in terms of a lot of cities specifically giving a lot of these wealthy guys hundreds of millions of dollars of tax money um, that could be going towards schools, that can go be, uh, be going to a number of things. Um, and it's really putting us at like a disadvantage because when you look at these sports stadiums, the jobs that they're creating are low wage jobs, but the people that are benefiting from it are the Donald Trumps, right? Mm-hmm. Um, to speak a little bit, when I was in St. Louis, uh, to give you an example of what I was talking about, I was working for uh, the St. Louis Rams at the time, mm-hmm. right? An owner of the St. Louis Rams, a guy named Stan Kroenke, he owns a number of sports teams, NHL, um, he owns the Rams, you know, he owns a few teams. And he's actually married to the daughter of the founder of Walmart. Mm. So this guy literally leveraged hundreds of millions of dollars from the city of St. Louis to build that football stadium. Mm. And the reason why the Rams actually left is because he couldn't get more tax money from taxpayers to build his dreams. So they ended up in L.A., right? Mm. So you see that with them. You see it. We saw it with George Steinbrenner, with the Yankees. I can go on and on, but... You have that same mentality of this entire game of these guys that have mastered finance and they're putting their friends on. And for a lot of us, like we're not even talking about it. Right. Um, Really. You know, so it really like struck a nerve with me. Same thing with Grant Cardone. Um, I was listening to a real estate podcast one time and he was actually and I kid you, like literally uh, word for word. He talked about him focusing his business um buying his properties in literally i quote liberal and democratic areas because they're not building there Mm. he's saying like the people aren't building there so 
in terms of things, he said that in all the people on the podcast, they all they all were white. Right. So in terms of things, it's like, hey, like you're literally making money off of people that look like me. Most Democrats, most liberals are going to look like me. And you're, you guys are literally laughing about how much you're making off of us, you know? So yeah. all these things, man, I don't want to go into like just a, but I, I can talk all day about these things. There's so many things that's going on. So it's really important for us to understand finance, understand what our, our grandparents went through, the redlining and, and signing contracts, and you don't really own it. Like there's so many elements of knowing your history and understanding finance, because if you don't, you're going to get screwed over. I can keep going on that, on that note. Yeah, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> you but, dropped a lot. Um, no, no. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. And I appreciate the honesty with that and just really um, getting to the core of what those things are. Because somebody could look at the move from St. Louis to L.A. and really just be thinking that as, you know, for these, you know, what appears to be surface level reasons, right? But there's a whole uh, uh, deep-rooted, you know, like you said, political, you know, um, instance behind it so what what i what i want to actually kind of touch on is kind of you know how you how you how you gain the knowledge because i feel like that's what either one we either don't know about these types of things so we don't even know how to ask about them or try to inquire on that type of information and it sounds like you know before equity capital started you were kind of already in the mindset of that whole investing and things like that so what types of things did you do to kind of put yourself on game when it comes to those things were there people that you had to seek to learn from did these come from those different opportunities that you had in sports um what were the some of those ways that you gained that knowledge to to really help you put you in a position to help others like us critical thinking right so uh, kind of going back into um you know what we kind of talked about so like i said i'm from patterson new jersey um, but I didn't go to high school in Patterson. My parents wouldn't let me, right? Yeah. They're like, yo, you're, you're not going to high school here. There's too much going on. Like you're not doing it. So, um, long story short in Patterson, you have so many liquor stores, you have so many, um, to check cash in places. Um, you have so many of these toxic businesses, um, even the fast food restaurants, like there's so many McDonald's and all, all this stuff. And it's like that stuff, that stuff is important to see, right? Because when I went to school in Montclair, New Jersey, they actually had none of that, right? Yeah. Like they only had like, I think, I don't know if I haven't been back to Montclair in a while, but they only had one fast food restaurant, a Popeye's in the black area. Yeah. <laughs> right? Typical. Right? Uh -huh. Exactly. Right. But just just that understanding of like, hey, why is that? And digging deeper and seeing, oh, well, they actually have city ordinances here that don't allow people to bring these businesses in. So why in the low income areas do we have these, you know, like um, everything I mentioned, but in the other areas where the suburban areas, there's actually laws here that don't allow that type of stuff. Right. Yeah. So just kind of going back to your question, just questioning things, right? Like there's anything, you know, we're all people, we all have access to the internet. So if there's anything that you feel is unjust in the world, read about it. So for me, um, I think reading is critical. I know, you know, kind of reading books is kind of going out of style. That's okay. You have podcasts just like the one you're doing. So if you're waking up in the morning and you're going to work, if you're commuting, you have to be learning something every week. So for me, uh, it's reading, it's listening to podcasts. Um, outside of that, cleaning up your social media feeds so that you always have some information coming in. So mm -hmm. for me, um, you know, I have one Twitter that might just be for social stuff. Um, but for one Twitter, I'm just following people that are going to make me smarter. Right. Yeah. So if it's reporters, if it's, you know, stuff about stocks, if it's anything about local cities that I can learn and educate myself, like you have to balance the educational content that's coming in. You have to consume it because if you're just watching TV all day or on world star hip hop or like any of that stuff is cool, but that becomes your reality if you allow it to. Right. Mm. And you're not, you're not, you're not elevating, you're putting a cap on yourself. So you always have to be learning and getting that content coming in. Absolutely. No, I appreciate that. So now when it comes to the, you know, the, the, I, I would say financial advice that you would give mm -hmm. to somebody who was looking to either start a venture like this, you know, what types of things would you, would you give to them? Because I feel like 
you know, the money is always, you know, a foundation when it comes to the things that we want to do and we want to achieve and making sure that we have that right is, you know, essential to, to those different opportunities that you want to give to yourself and create for others. So what, what type of financial advice would you give to somebody who's 16 or 17, maybe thinking about, you know, trying to start an organization or maybe even taking that traditional route of, uh, of finding work within whatever industry that they feel they're most passionate about? What would you say to them? Understanding the value of your time. I think that's number one. Uh, I have one friend in particular. Uh, he's in the Bay Area, and this guy is an influencer on um, on TikTok, right? Mm-hmm. So he 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 really raised his followers, and when he started getting to the level of what brands were able to sponsor him, he didn't have anyone else to talk to. So what he did was he talked to the brand in particular, and they told him, "Hey, we're going to offer you this." So he accepted that. And later on, he started making some other friends who were in, you know, that didn't look like us. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And he found out the offer that he got, they lowballed him. Right. So in terms of thing, understanding the value of your time and what your real worth is. So talking to other people, if you're going out there, hey, you know, what are some of these other people getting or what are you know, what's the market out there? Um, You really have to understand that value of your time. So I definitely say that's one. Uh, I wrote down a few others. Um, relevant education. We talked about that um, just in terms of, you know, making sure that the, the, the either the people around you or the information that you're, uh, you're getting is always relevant. Um, and I'd say a big thing, too, that's really important, especially to our community, is uh, uh, mental health and understanding trauma. Mm-hmm. Right. I think one of the biggest um, things that I learned, to be honest, within, you know, our community is understanding that that value of debt. And for a lot of uh, generations before us, or like uh, even some of our parents, they did that, hey, I'm gonna just put my money in a shoebox somewhere because I don't trust the bank. There's a lot of trauma there, right? Yeah. Or, yeah. hey, you know, when it comes to debt, all debt is bad, bad, so I'm not gonna leverage this debt or I'm not gonna do this cash out refinance or the second mortgage on this house to buy another one. Um, so understanding that, you know, though we may look at our family members, particularly our parents as like our loved ones or as our, you know, like our role models, sometimes there's a lot of trauma um, that either our grandparents or our parents have that they do pass on to us. Right. Yeah. And I think we as a people, especially like generations now, you have the access to the Internet, you have access to all these opportunities. So you really have to manifest that. You really have to understand like, hey, you know, just because my parents went through this, uh, my job is to be better than that. So, yeah, um, yeah, the mental health component, understanding value of your time um, and relevant education. I'd say there's one, two, three. Perfect, man. That's that's really well said. And, um, you know, yeah, we would try to advocate for, you know, self-care and things like that. Um, I love how you pointed out the whole trauma thing, because you may not know the why behind some of the advice that you've gotten either from mentors or from your parents until later on and you figure out, oh, that's why they said these things. Well, this is actually how it is, you know, based on, on learning that. So um, I love how you question the world. I love the whole the, uh, critical thinking that you do kind of on a consistent basis. And that's kind of how, what's brought on a lot of that knowledge that you have. Um, I'd love to talk more and, and kind of pick your brain. Uh, we do got to wrap things up, but I do want you to actually see if you can provide our listeners with a book recommendation, um, you know, um, as much as, you know, we would like to think reading is going out of style, really specifically books. Um, I would like to vouch for audio books. That's a thing, you know, just in case people forgot. Um, but is, is there a book that, you know, anybody can pick up to really start, um, you know, kind of cultivating their mind into that mindset that will kind of get them to higher heights? Or if it's on a specific topic that you feel like everybody uh, within our community should know, what would you recommend? Uh, so the book that actually got me started, you know, we talked about sports and politics. Um, I was really more interested in uh, the stuff that we talked about when it came to sports in the yeah. sense of, you know, a lot of these owners kind of pointing their fingers at us uh, saying, you know, like in terms of stuff, you guys are just on welfare. You guys are just, you know, getting money from the government. Come to find out they're actually taking on more, you know, money from the government than a lot of us uh, us are. Right. So right, right. Um, to answer answer your question, there's a book called um, Bad Sports. 
uh, how owners are ruining the games we love by an author called Dave Zirin. And he breaks down everything. Some of the stuff that I even talked about today where it comes down to, you know, there's an interest in sports, but how are these guys, these owners leveraging tax money to make sure that, you know, they're doing, they're doing a lot of things, you know? Yeah, so yeah, um, that's, yeah. that's definitely one. I love that book. It, it's, I read it in, in high school and, you know, my mind's been going since then. Perfect, man. Bad sports, everybody. So definitely pick up a copy, uh, read, listen, however you want to consume it. Uh, Trey, it's been an honor to have you on the show. You've, you've dropped a lot of a lot of great knowledge. Um, probably got to bring you back on, just kind of pick your brain a little bit more. It sounds like you have a lot that you want to share. Um, I, I definitely want to see uh, Bequity grow. Um, so I'll you know be trying to keep up, follow, and, and touch base with you to see how things are going. But um, any last words? Um, you know, tell the people how they can reach you if they wanted to reach out. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, we're we're in the process of building out Instagram, man. So bear with me. I'm doing a lot right now in terms of dealing with the contractors and the lawyers right now. But um, at Bequity Capital, that's our uh, our Instagram handle and. As we build things out and turn it into a real estate fund, we'll definitely pick up content there. We have a few posts now, but just not much. But at Bequity Capital would be the best. Perfect. All right, man. Well, thank you for, for coming on the show. Um, thanks, everybody, for listening. Um, as always, like, comment, share, and subscribe to the podcast. We would definitely love to hear your feedback. Uh, we definitely love those high ratings. You know, any, anything that you can give us um, that, that support is, is more than appreciated. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's at Inquire Hire. Uh, we also have our website, inquirehire.com. We've got a lot of great information there. If you need any type of help with college preparation. We have uh, a multitude of services there. So if you are looking to try to figure out what you want to do or and, you know, trying to juggle between these different award letters that these schools have given you, we would love to be of some help, uh, some assistance to you. So until next time, peace to you. Enjoy your day.